Yes, Lord, Father, your love endures forever. And we thank you, Lord, that mighty is the one who is with us. Mighty is the one who is within us. We thank you that you do fight for us, Lord. We thank you that you have already won the victory for us. God, we come with hearts full of thanksgiving and full of praise and adoration to you, Lord. And we ask now, Lord, that if there's anything in our hearts, anything in our minds that would distract us, Lord, from giving you our all in worship, Lord, that these things would be cast aside, that we would lay down every weight and every sin that so easily besets us, that we may run this race with patience and perseverance. And Lord God, you know what we need today. You know those who are sick physically. You know those who are struggling with anxieties and fears and depressions, Lord. You know those who, who don't even know you as Lord and Savior. May today be their day of salvation. Lord, we ask that you would just pour out your spirit here in our midst. Lord, let your word in, the time, in this time of worship transform our hearts and our minds toward you. All to your glory, Lord. Be glorified today. Lord, we want to give you a sweet praise, Lord. Let it be a sweet sound in your ear today. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.
Christ shall come. When Christ shall come. When shall come. It's your grace in our lives. 
great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Lord, we lift our eyes to you for great are you, Lord. You're seated on your throne. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. One more time. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Yes, Lord, we're grateful for all you've done for us. Lord, your great and mighty hand is evident throughout the earth. And Lord, we thank you that you're a sovereign God. Lord, we praise you this morning for all that you are and all that you've done. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Say a quick hello to somebody. Good morning. Good, morning. Good morning. You guys came ready to worship today, didn't you? Yes, yes. And we didn't even have the Spanish worship that we had last, but you really came to worship. Tuan, you, you turn it up a notch there, huh? I thought maybe you'd learn Spanish this week, too, you know. I figure if you learn one language every month, you know, we could have quite a, uh, quite a display of the uh, universal message of the gospel, but uh, wasn't last week great as well with uh, having Silo share, but uh, our own worship team, you guys did a fantastic job, and really as Tawana and I talked about, you guys are the worship team. Um, uh, a performance is someone at a concert, uh, but you participating, uh, you are uh, the worship, and so God, uh, I know, was really pleased that was a sweet fragrance. Uh, good to see everyone here. It's back to vacation season, and, and I know we have some people that are already traveling that are joining us uh, online, so welcome to whoever they are. We have uh, this, this Thursday, I don't know, is Xavier in here somewhere? But, you know, we met uh, Xavier and I. His brother has started a Bible study in Samoa. They've started watching our messages wow. in Samoa. Hey, yeah, isn't that great? Yeah. Small fellowship. We could have a future Troy Palamalu in that in that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, in that fellowship, um, but uh, they have about 15 people meeting. They watched one of our Ephesians uh, studies, and they can't watch them live because uh, we had a 4.30 call with the pastor, and it was 9.30 in the morning the following day there, so, uh, so they have to kind of watch them uh, delayed, but uh, uh, shout out to our friends in Samoa and other places that are watching us, some of, some of uh, who are watching us live right now. But uh, we're glad you're here. Uh, I know we have some visitors. Uh, welcome to Calvary Chapel, Richmond. Uh, we pray every week uh, for revival, and we're going to do that in just a second. Uh, you probably saw what happened in London uh, last night. Um, uh, one, of my, one of my hopes and dreams is that I will get to preach at Calvary Chapel, London. I got to go there before I left uh, the business world to be a full-time pastor. My last major, well, second to last major trip, I went to London. And I got to go to Calvary Chapel, London, only for about 45 minutes before I had to leave, and then it was off to meetings and stuff. But I got to go there on a Sunday morning, and if you ever get a chance to go, it's in the Westminster area, not, not too far from Buckingham Palace and all that stuff. The Calvary Chapel there, they meet in the middle school, and it looks like the United Nations. It is awesome. London, whatever London used to be many years ago, London is an incredibly diverse city, just like New York City. I mean, there's no, it's just as diverse as you can possibly imagine. Every language, every... But all these believers, uh, some of them with their iPads, some of them with Bibles, and, but all of them gathered there. Uh, and so pray for London because God does have believers there that are strategically placed. Uh, but God cares as much for what happened in the Philippines this past week and other parts of the world. And so just uh, pray that the peace of the gospel will be presented by those that live in these places, missionaries that are going to these places. The only hope for this world and this nation is Jesus Christ. Amen? Uh, the only way that we'll see peace, people will still keep killing other people, still, still keep murdering and hating and all this stuff. It's only going to be 
you and I having the gospel flow through us. And we'll be talking about this today. You see that we'll be talking about the household of God in Ephesians 2. And Ephesus was the city that was a melting pot. And Paul was like, if you guys can get it, anybody can get it. Isn't that great to know? So why don't you stand as we pray. We pray for revival for our own country. The only hope for our country is revival. The only hope in this room is revival. Our church needs revival. And I'm, I, I, I've been praying, as, if you're here Wednesday night, we had an awesome time of prayer Wednesday night. If you don't come to prayer, start coming to prayer because we prayed for three things as we closed. We prayed that even in our church, if we have people that are unsaved, that they would get saved. Did you know that people go to church and aren't even saved? Yeah, that happens. Even at a Calvary Chapel, at a Baptist church, at a Methodist church, there's people that come and they don't know the Lord. So the second thing we prayed is that those that are asleep, that are saved, would be awakened they're asleep. They used to read their Bible, but they don't anymore. They used to pray, but they don't anymore. They used to share their faith, but they don't anymore. They used to want to be at church when the doors were open, but now, eh, once a year, once a month, three times, eight, eight weeks, something like that. God needs to awaken them. Jesus said, even more gathering as you see the day approaching. Well, the day is closer now than it was when that was written. 2,000 years closer. And the last group is those that are fighting the good fight and they are weary. They're fighting hard for Jesus. But they're fighting so hard, they're like one soldier fighting off 20. And they need a refreshing and outpouring. And maybe that's some of you. This. All three groups God loves, by the way. The unsaved, the sound asleep, and the wide awake but fighting hard and really about to collapse. I don't know which group you're in, but God uh, really wants to refresh. You know revival refreshes all three groups? Brings lost saved sleep awake, and people that are fighting hard, all of a sudden they can run and soar like eagles. That's what God wants to do. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this morning, and we thank you for the freedom we have to gather. Lord, so many around the world cannot gather like this because of persecution or religious opposition. And Lord, we have been given such great grace, amazing grace. You've shed your grace on this country. And we're thankful for that. But Lord, we pray for a revival. We pray for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, let it start with us. Lord, we need, we need to be refreshed. We need to have our sins forgiven. We thank you for grace, Lord. We know that you'll forgive any sin in this room if we just call upon the name. Lord, you're gracious and full of compassion. Your mercies are new every day. We pray for an outpouring of your spirit to save the lost, awaken those who are asleep, and Lord, refresh those that are fighting the good fight in all their imperfections, and all their failures, but Lord, truly need to be strengthened by you. And we pray, Lord, you would have a special work in this service today. And Lord, we pray for our country and all the nations of the world that they would turn to living Christ. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, turn with me to Ephesians 2. If you don't have a Bible... If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand. We'll be glad to put one in your hand. Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, we're finishing the second chapter this morning. Uh, we'll be covering verses 19 through 22. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand. It should be marked. I see that hand. Do we have one Bible for the front row up here? It should be marked already. And I'll be just reading uh, verses 19 through 22, so read along with me. You don't have to read out loud, but um, Ephesians 2, starting with verse 19. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundations of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit let's pray over our text and you pray for me you know when when we pray over this text I need your prayers as much as I'm praying over this so you pray for me while I pray for the Lord to bless this time Lord we thank you for this time we pray your blessing on your word, and Lord, you change each and every one of us. Lord, we pray that by your spirit you would drive out anything that is of the enemy in this room. 
that you would quench every dart of the enemy, that we would hear crystal clear the voice of the Lord, strengthen your people, and Lord, just return us to that first love, united with you, but together. In your name we pray, amen. The household of God. Is it a home? Is it a fortress? Is it a sanctuary? Is it a temple? Is it a family? Is it a kingdom? Is it a place? Is it a person? Is it many persons? Is it a place of rest or is it a place of work and service? Is it here or is it an eternity? Is it physical or is it spiritual? Is it visible or is it invisible? Yes. If you've heard me teach, I, I do this from time to time. You say, well, how can it be all of those things? Yes. The household of God is supernatural. And in one sense, it's beyond description. And yet it's accessible to a little child or an aging adult. It's deeply complex, and yet, get this, it's simplistic in its operation. Did you hear that? The household of God is deeply complex, yet simple in its operation. In the household of God, peace rules and reigns, and everyone is invited to the household of God, but not everybody comes. Everyone's invited. You ever, you ever thrown a, <clears throat> a dinner and you put out an invite list, but not everybody came? They were certainly invited, but not everybody comes. Not everybody wants to come in. And Paul continues here in chapter 2 of Ephesians to describe to the Ephesians who they have responded to the invitation of what God has done for them and in them and now in himself. And God has made them <clears throat> alive from formerly being completely dead in sin, just like you and I were, brought peace into their hearts and into their minds, and has broken down those walls of division that we looked at last week. Broken down those walls of division between Jews, between Gentiles, between people groups. Now, I was thinking this morning as I was praying, I said, God, you love Muslims. You love Hindus. You love atheists who say you don't even exist. And when they get saved, God breaks down the walls of all those groups, doesn't he? It doesn't matter what color you are, all that stuff. God breaks those walls down. It's God that establishes relationships. Back in verse 4, look in your Bibles in Ephesians 2. Back in verse 4, it said, uh, but God. And in verse 13, it says, but now. And here in verse 19, it says, now therefore. So we have these transitions, and they're not just little transitions. They're big, but God transitions. But now. Now therefore. Now therefore. What does this mean? He's emphasizing one final piece of the picture. But God, but now, which was Jesus Christ, but God, but Christ, now therefore, he's emphasizing this one final piece of the picture in understanding what God has done in us individually, but also us collectively as the church. And we want to look at three things this morning in our time together. I'm sure I'm one here. Just advance me to our standing. You'll see it in the deck. Just There we go. Now, what do I mean by that? Let's take a look at um, starting in verse 19. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers. So at one time we were. We looked at this last week. We were afar off. We're no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God. We're no longer afar off, which is back in verse 17. And he preached peace to you who are afar off. We've been brought near to God. We've been given access to the Father's presence. We talked about that. But we're not visitors. When I go to pray to the Father, I'm not a visitor. When I go to Subway, I'm a visitor. <laughs> right? 
In some places, I'm only going once after you say, oh, this isn't so great. I won't be visiting here anymore. We're not visitors to the household of God. When your kids come home, do you say, hey, we got some visitors here? <laughs> no, they're not visitors. We've been given access to the Father's presence. We're not visitors. We're not outsiders. We're not even welcome guests. Welcome guests is a good thing, but we're not welcome guests. We're beyond welcome guests. Amen. Amen. I mean, it's good to be a welcome guest. I've been a guest in other countries. I've been a guest in other homes. But you're in the Father's plan, we're not just welcome guests. We've been made by Christ and through the Spirit of God, citizens of the kingdom of God. Jesus said, when you pray, pray this way, thy what come? Kingdom come. We've been made citizens of the kingdom of God and fellow members of the household and family of God. God is in the adopting business. He doesn't have any natural born, his son, Jesus, but the rest, that was there for all eternity, but the rest of us are adopted in. The distinction was particularly relevant uh, when he's talking about citizens here. This is particularly relevant to the Ephesian hearers because they knew and understood that Roman citizenship, and under the Roman Empire, Roman citizenship was very valuable and it was prized in that day. Paul's interaction with a Roman centurion, you can read about it in Acts chapter 22. I don't have time to turn there. But it underscores why citizenship would resonate with the Ephesians, why Paul would even use the word uh, citizenship here. In Acts 22, 28, it says, The commander answered, speaking to Paul, With a large sum, I obtained this citizenship. And Paul said, I was born a citizen. Beat that. Right? But, but the commander said, I had to spend a whole boatload of money to become a citizen. Extremely valuable. But if you hear today, you can't buy citizenship into heaven. You can't say, well, I'd, uh, I'm a billionaire, uh, Warren Buffett. I would just like to give $100 million for mine. Can't buy it. That's right. Can't buy citizenship. You can only be born again into it. Born again into the kingdom of God. Born again into the household of God. Born again into this citizenship. And then what Jesus told Nicodemus, remember Nicodemus, religious leader, very religious, uh, knew, the, knew the Old Testament, visits Jesus in the middle of the night, a little embarrassed, right? Comes in the middle of the night in John chapter 3. Jesus said, all of your works aren't good enough. You, I know you're Jewish. I know you're a descendant of uh, Abraham. That's true. But you need to be a member of the household of God. And that only comes by Jesus saying, being born again. Well, I've already been born by my mother. He said, then what's flesh is flesh. I'm talking about the spirit. You've got to be reborn from above. But this invaluable citizenship uh, is given to us through what? It's through repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father, comes to the household, comes to the front door of the house, there's no back door entrance. There's only the front door of Jesus, and that's only through repentance in Jesus Christ. And this is given to everyone in Ephesus that Paul had met. They would all receive the same message, whether they're Jew or Gentile. And every one of them that received that message, believed and repented and put their faith in Jesus Christ, they were made alive just like you and me. Same as the exact process 2,000 years uh, later here. And all of our citizenship, this citizenship supersedes any other citizenship. Also, when you understand that God says you've been made citizens of the household of God, um, we are as much citizens of God's kingdom now as the saints that are already up in heaven. Isn't that great to know? We're as much citizens of heaven right now. Say, well, I don't live in heaven. Well, you know, when I leave the country this summer to go to El Salvador, I'm as much of a U.S. citizen in El Salvador as I am here. When you start and I start believing that our real citizenship is in heaven, we'll start acting like heaven. When we believe this is our citizenship, we'll act like America. We'll act like the world. We, when we start to realize that our true citizenship is up there, It'll change the way we live down here. 
In Philippians 3.20, Paul wrote, For our citizenship is in heaven, from whom uh, we also eagerly await for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you really believe, Christian, that you're more of a citizen of heaven than you are an American? I'm thankful to be an American, but my citizenship in heaven far supersedes, which is why I love America, but I also love the Congo and people in Austria and people in North Korea. And because we're not, those are the ones that you're going to spend all eternity with. It's that citizenship, that global salvation that Jesus has done. But more than just citizens of the same kingdom, we've all become members of the same household, the same home, the same father, the same family. It was cool uh, uh, on Thursday when, uh, and I see Xavier's here now, we were on the, we were on the call with Samoa, and I, and I was praying, I said, you know, Lord, it's awesome that Chris is in Samoa, me and Xavier are here in Chesterfield County, but we're all three standing in the same throne room right now. Amen. Amen. And through the magic of modern day, you know, Skype and, uh, and phones and stuff, we can actually have a voice conversation and all be in the same throne room of God. Isn't that great? Amen. But really, we're in the living room of God because we're in this household of God. We've all been adopted personally by God through Jesus into the family. We may look different, but here's the cool thing. We make an awesome family photo. <laughs> we may look a lot different, but a lot different makes a great family photo, and God's building this family photo even as we speak. Remember that Pointer Sister song, We Are Family? Remember that? It always brings up bad memories to me because I was a Baltimore Oriole fan and the Pittsburgh Pirates came back and I was miserable because the Pirates came back and won. I was like, I don't want to hear this song. But they're right. We are family. It's not just sisters either. It's a, a lot of other people too. But I tell you what, it, it, when you're a family, we have to not just know we're a family, but embrace being a family. Amen. Amen. It's one thing, you know, there's people that have family and they don't have a good family life. This isn't God's family. You have to embrace the family of God. Say so you've been adopted into it, now you must embrace it. Families are supposed to love each other. Amen. Amen. Families are supposed to be there for one another. Families are supposed to encourage one another. They're supposed to help one another. They're supposed to Pray for one another. Supposed to share meals together. Now, all of this takes time, surrender, effort. It's an intentional recognition that we're now in a family. The acronym from Dennis Waitley's Seeds of Greatness on Love is this L, listening when others are speaking. You have to practice to listen, to hear other people in the family of God. I want to hear them, not just like, as soon as you're done, I'm ready to pipe in. I didn't hear a word you said because I've got my list to dump on you or to supersede what you just said or whatever, listening when others are speaking. Oh, overlooking petty faults and forgiving all failures. Everyone fails. You've got to forgive those things. V, value in other people for who they are. You know, that person, however you are, is how God made you. You start looking at something and say, hey, they got all kinds of issues. That's how God made them. He's still working on them just like you. They look at you and they say, you've got a lot of issues too. E, expressing love in a practical way. In a practical way, tangible way. These are things that bond a family. But we're not just a family. The family of God is a family on a mission to reach the rest of the world and bring more into the family, more adoptions. Remember I've said before, when God goes into an adoption, you know, uh, let's say it's um, a nursery, and they say, you can adopt any, God says, I'll adopt them all. Then say, well, I'll take that one and that one, but that's all I can afford. God has no limitations. He's adopting everyone. This family is on a mission now. So don't forget one other important factor that takes place in a family. Because the church is one large family with smaller family. You ever been to a family reunion? And you know that 
the family reunion, we're all one family, but this is cousin side over here, this is cousin side over here, aunt and uncle, uh, this is our crazy uncle over here, and you know, they've got all these different people, but it's one family. Well, that's the family of God, but then you have the individual families. We'll get into this a little bit later, exactly what this means. You have these individual families, but in a family, there's family life. Do you know everyone has chores to do in a family? Everyone plays a role. In Luke chapter 12, verse 35 through 36, again, these are Jesus' words, not mine. Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning, and you yourselves be like men who wait for their master. Do you know what waist girded meant? You were a servant. You were mopping the floors. You were bringing the food. You were cleaning up. You had to have the lamps lit. You had to keep putting oil in the lamps. You had to be like one waiting for their master. You, ever, you know, when you go to a restaurant, you get a waiter. They are supposed to wait on you. And it's their job to say, what else can I do for you? What else can I do? This is what we're supposed to be doing for one another and for the Lord. Everyone in the family is supposed to be serving. In our house, we have three daughters, no sons. And no one's going to get my name passed on, sorry to say. But the more I see those of you that have little boys, I am really glad at times. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for not giving me a son. I'm, too, I'm wound up enough as it is. Um, we have family over. The boys, my house is about to be torn to pieces. The girls are like reading and stuff, you know, but... <laughs> Um, I love your sons, don't get me wrong, but I'm just, I'm just saying that sometimes you realize later God knows what he's doing. So anyway, we have three girls in our house, and um, did you know that we require all of them to do stuff? We're going to say, you know, you too, because you have a gifting, you don't have to do anything. Just this one has to, you're Cinderella, you've got to do everything, Right? Now, everyone has to be part of the team. Everyone has to pull their weight. Everyone has to work in the family of God. Brother and sister, if you're here, God has a place for you on the wall to be working for the Lord, not just, well, well my job is to critique messages. Well, we've got enough people doing that. Everyone has to put some rice on the stove. Everyone has to put silverware on the table. Everyone has to clean up. Everyone has to find a place. Say, Lord, where am I supposed to be girded and serving? That's our standing, a family of God. We get all the benefits of the citizenship and the family of God, but we also have responsibility within the family of God. This is the standing that the Ephesians have. This is what we have. Next, and since my battery must be dead, take a look at our next, our security, if you're taking notes. And even if you're not taking notes, our security... Look at verse 20. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. You and I have been brought into a personal faith, a family as we've discussed, and a unity. But here's the awesome news. This has an immovable foundation. Can't be moved. You know, you've got these commercials for, is your house suffering from a foundation crack issue? God's foundation has no cracks, never will. Amen. It'll never need JES or whoever that, uh, you know, come in there and help fix the foundation. The prophets and the apostles, what does this mean? The prophets and the apostles, they represent the Word of God. The Old Testament is called the Law and the Prophets. The New Testament is from the epistles and, the, and what Jesus gave to the apostles and the early church. The Law and the prophets, or the prophets and the apostles here, represents the word of God. And all of that represents Christ, who said he is the word incarnate. He's the word made flesh. So the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So when it says the prophets and the apostles, it's simply saying everything Jesus spoke through men is in the word, and that's the foundation. Why we go verse by verse to the Bible at Calvary Chapel is the word is the foundation. But not just the written word, the living word. If it was only written word, I could preach a message and just be knowledgeable message, but it has to be preached with the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the living word meets the written word. You don't want just the written word because that's actually legalism. People just become Pharisees. But when the, living, when the written word and the living word are the foundation, 
You don't have Pharisees. Well, you still can, but God breaks that up more and more. He kind of plows that heart and says, no, no, no. You need the law, the prophets, the apostles, but you need it in the spirit of the Lord, which is Christ. This is the bedrock of our faith. Someone asked an astronaut once, how does it feel to be inside the space capsule? The astronaut replied, well, it makes you think when everything is done according to the lowest bid, it really makes you think. <laughs> the foundation of our faith, the foundation of the church, the foundation of the family of God was not purchased with the lowest bid. It was not done on government contract, lowest possible bid or whatever else. It was purchased with the highest bid. The bid was the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And the Father set the price. And it's worth more. Think about this. The foundation that Jesus laid with the word of God made flesh. The foundation is worth more than every person, every angel, every creative thing, every living thing, every non-living thing, every visible thing, every invisible thing, all combined. Isn't that amazing? It's worth more than all of it. This foundation's worth more than all of that. Colossians 1.18 says, And he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Christ is the only perfect definition of security. There it is. Even when I, was in, when I was in the business world, I, was in, I worked for a high-tech company, and we had a saying that we said among ourselves all the time, security is a myth, and yet people are buying it by the millions. I'm not saying that you shouldn't have, I do use dead bolts, and you know, we have an alarm system and all that stuff, but it only can take you so far, true? Which is true, yes. You can be armed to the teeth and still, Goliath found this out, one shot right here, boom. So security has its limitations, but not the security that God has laid, not the foundation that he has laid. Christ is the only perfect definition of security, and the perfect foundation was laid when he laid down his life. That's when the foundation was laid. And that's why it says he's the cornerstone. He's the cornerstone. He can't be moved. He won't be moved. He's the one we stand on. We stand in, and we will stand on forever if we really believe in him. Do you believe you'll stand with Jesus forever? Yeah. Yeah. He'll never be moved. He's sitting on the throne for all eternity. It says in um, Isaiah 28, 16, I love this passage, Therefore thus says the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for foundation, a tried stone, a precious stone, a sure foundation. God says, the world has never seen the foundation I'm about to lay when I send my son. Once that foundation is laid, it can never be moved. You can stand on the rock. Jesus said whoever falls on the rock will be saved. But if you say, well, I, I just kind of want to look at the rock from a distance. There's only salvation and firmness in standing on the rock. Mark 12, 10, <clears throat> and Jesus was quoting here in Psalm 118, 22. Uh, so Jesus quoted the Old Testament quite a bit. He said, have you not read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become what? The chief cornerstone. Right. Now, when this was prophesied, Jesus was the fulfillment of it. He was that chief cornerstone. And we may have personally, you and I, I, I did. For 25 years, I rejected the cornerstone. I wanted the bars. I wanted fun. I wanted what I wanted to do. I wanted my dreams, my hopes, my th my." definition of fun. You had your own definition of fun. Some of our definitions were identical and just as you know, faulty. But now we put our faith and our trust and our future in Christ, the cornerstone. We've now banked our entire lives on the security of the rock of our salvation. Is that true for you? Have you banked your entire life on the security of Christ, the rock of your salvation? Did you know a million things could dissolve everything you have tonight? Say, so, oh, that could never happen. If you've not studied world history, there is no sure thing except Jesus. Amen. Amen. There isn't. 
I was talking about Wednesday night. I've been praying this week, by the way. I've, I've, I have been praying for Kathy Griffin, Tiger Woods, and all kinds of other celebrities and well-known people. Yeah. I don't have any animosity or hatred towards any of them. I don't. Because Jesus is reaching out to them with love. Yes, yeah. I pray for terrorists. How about you? Here's the thing. As Tiger Woods. I used to love to watch him play golf. I hope he comes back and someday plays really good again. I really do. He's got $700 million, but he's still not happy. He's got the wrong foundation. He's got more money than I'll ever dream about. But you're like, you need all these kind of medications and you're, and you're sad and depressed. And you know, God's reaching out to him saying, I've got a plan for your life. It's better than winning a Masters. It's better than winning golf tournaments or whatever else it is. <clears throat> we banked our lives on the security of Christ. And not only us, but the apostles and prophets, they banked their life on the Messiah to come. It's mentioned here, the apostles and prophets. They banked their life. They died for the faith. You realize that the apostles, uh, all but one died for the faith because they banked that their future was secure in the Lord. Last thing we want to look at this morning, these last two verses, our sanctification. I've had this off the whole time. So anyway. <laughs> hey, I didn't have to admit it. I'm just telling you. I could have kept, kept that information to myself. But I'm here to tell you, I'm a flawed individual. More ways than you know. And so these messages, I, I can promise you, I preach them to me well before they ever hit your ears. Let's look at our last one. Thank you, Kate. It's good to have a team back there. It's, that's a good illustration. Do you, know, do you know that this illustrates why it's important to have people in your life? You're messing up more than you think you are. You've got people walking behind you, picking. You ever, you ever seen a Leslie Nielsen movie? You know, it's, this is our life. Don't think too much of a Leslie Nielsen. You know, there, there's, there's way, but as my unsaved days, I, I, un, I understand that. But our sanctification here. These final two verses, look what it says. In whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also being built together for a dwelling place of God and the Spirit. These final two verses explain two fundamental truths, the saints saved by God and the saints assembled as one in God. Okay? We're all saved by God, but then assembled as one in him. We, on the one hand, follow this train of thought, we, on the one hand, from a promise standpoint, from a promise standpoint, and from God's eternity standpoint, we are 100% sealed already in heaven. From a promise standpoint, and from God's eternal viewpoint, we're already sealed in heaven. You can look back to uh, chapter 1, verse 3. Paul says this. He says... Um, who has uh, given us every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We'll say, I'm not up in heaven right now. From a promise standpoint and from God's perspective, you are, if you're saved. Amen. Chapter 2, verse 6, same, same chapter we're in. Go up to the sixth verse. It says, and he has raised us up together and made us sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So, well, I'm sitting, in, uh, I'm sitting in one of these really comfortable chairs right now, not in heaven. Well, from God's perspective, no, we're already sealed and promised and seated with the other saints. In future and in God's outside of time perspective. This is, you've got to understand, sometimes the Bible's talking about the here and now. Sometimes it's talking about God's view of eternity. It's fully complete. Jesus was slain. We understand this also was demonstrating the life of Jesus. Jesus, according to the scripture, was slain before the foundation of the earth. We'll say, I thought it was 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem. It was. But it was completed in God's economy before it ever happened. Yet, so God is outside of our understanding of this, but we can kind of get our mind around it to some extent. Then Jesus came and he actually finished the work, even though God said it was done before it happened. And this is the second fundamental truth of who we are individually and collectively. We're justified, and we're sealed, and we're complete in Christ. That's a done deal. If you've repented and put your faith in Christ, he will not take your salvation away from you. You can decide you don't want it anymore, but God will never take it away from you. You say, oh, I don't want this anymore. I want to be an atheist now. God will, that, that's your choice, but he will never, 
let anyone pluck you out. You'd have to say, I want out. He will never take away your salvation. Our abiding testifies to our authenticity. That's why Jesus said, abide in me. Uh, the scripture says that we have eternal security. We have the eternal security of the saints because the Holy Spirit's been given us to help us abide. We couldn't even abide if it wasn't for God. But the, we could say, I don't want the Spirit. But we say, no, we will abide. That's the testimony of our authenticity is that we abide in the Lord. But this second truth um, we have the first understanding that, yes, we are sealed. That's our justification, right? But this second truth is our sanctification, our sanctification. Well, that's a process, isn't it? Those of you who have been saved for a few years, you, you know that the process is taking longer than you expected, right? It's like a wait time at a doctor's office. It's going to be longer than you probably were hoping and our sanctification takes longer. We're still saved. But sometimes we think, are we really? Because would I really have that thought? Sanctification takes a while. That, that doesn't mean you stopped abiding in Christ. That doesn't mean you bailed on the Lord. It just means you still have flesh that needs to be put to death. It has to be mortified, and the, and the Lord helps us do that over time. Just like um, Jesus came and fulfilled that guaranteed work of salvation... Um, we have to, in the work of sanctification, we have to walk it out. We have to walk out that uh, life of salvation. We have the guarantee that Christ will never take our salvation, but we still have to walk it out, right? If your employer says, if you come to work today and put eight, out, eight hours, we promise to pay you. If you say, I'd like to phone it in, will that work? <laughs> See, this promise is conditional. You've got to actually come walk this thing out. We're not going to fire. You will not be fired. You will not be let go. But you must come and do what you've been asked to do. And God says, all right, I've saved you. Now you've got to walk this thing out. Right. That's sanctification. There's security in it, but, but there is still this responsibility. God says, now, and really, even as we walk it out, God's doing the work because we couldn't change ourselves if we wanted to. We just are following obedience. And we see here, though, the building this mention, in whom the whole building fitted together, this building, uh, think about the fact that we have our personal building, that's your body, your personal tabernacle, you are one little building, but then we are put together as a larger building, the body of Christ, fitted together, one in the Lord, the house of God. And both the larger structure and you and me, the little smaller individual tabernacles, we are all still under construction. Understand that? This, the text tells us this. It says, whom the whole building fitted together grows. Grows is a state of actually it's changing into a holy temple in whom you are being built together. The construction cranes are still on us and still on the church. It's a process. Both are under construction, growing, being fitted, being assembled. But unlike other buildings, like the building we're in, this building is actually alive. It's a living building. It's, there's no other building like the body of Jesus Christ. It's a living building. The household of God is alive. Each individual cell in you and me is a collection of cells that are maturing and are going through a process, but they're all necessary, one another, to make up the entire body. They all help us take literal steps forward. Whether it's a body built, being built up, and you think about the cells inside of a body, again, it's kind of following that thought, uh, the cells inside of a body, they're all necessary to build up for things like speed, stamina, strength, right? You say, well, that, these cells probably don't matter. Oh, yeah, they do. You think the kidney matters? Well, you don't think about it, but it matters, right? All of these things play a role. And it's not an easy process to build the body up. It's not an easy process to build the spiritual body up. A building, you think about a building, a building has to be nailed together. Anyone ever done any framing of houses and things like that? A building has to be nailed together. It has to be put together. It has to be, pieces have to be cut. Pieces have to be shaped. Some have to be bent. 
Some construction is in cold days. Some days is in blazing hot days. Some days is in raining days. I remember when I framed houses for two summers in college, uh, I learned about all the different fun. And then I did uh, winter break. I would come and you know, I'd work in the freezing cold and you got these splits in your fingers. But the building must go on, right? It's called a timeline. God has a timeline for all of us. We don't know what it is, but we're on one. Individual for us, but also collective as the body of Christ. And it's, but building buildings are not a five-minute job, are they? Take some patience. Has, a, has to have a plan. Has to have a blueprint. But the blueprint belongs to God. The blueprint for us and the blueprint for the church. A.W. Tozer says, the health of our souls requires that we take the whole Bible as it is, as it stands, and let it do its work in us. Do you take the whole Bible as truth and let it do its work in you? We have to. Are we submitted to the blueprint of God? Are we submitted to the building plan of God? The growth plan of God in us and one another. And if we are, we'll stand on the word of God, we'll stay in the word of God, and we'll walk by the spirit of God. But notice the process. You, me, and the church are inseparable. Just like I actually needed the sound people to cover up for the fact that I read off, or I read off as it was on when I should have been reading on as it on. We have a need for one another that we don't always know we do. But God says, trust me, you need each other. I've put you together for a reason. The teaching ministry and the ministry of um, the apostles uh, it l eliminates, if you read the ministry of the apostles, you read the teaching of Jesus, it eliminates any possibility of a lone ranger faith. You would never be able to read the Bible and say, I think, I think I figured this out. I'm supposed to read my Bible, hang out by myself, and watch TV evangelists. That's all I need to do. And I can be just as, just as growing as anyone else. No. We do have a personal walk, and we have a personal race to run. But it's done in unison with others. It's done in unison with others. We're like running, our running together is like a marine platoon. You ever seen they run together? Everybody gets up at the same time. Everyone runs the same race. It starts in Paris Island, and they get to uh, indoctrinated with this uh, fun activity. And they run it together. This is not like the jogger that just says, oh, I think I'll run at 5. I think I'll run, yeah, today I'm going to run at 9 a.m. Oh, tomorrow I'm going to run at 5 a.m. No, that's running by yourself. The, the family of God says, no, no, you're in a platoon to run together, not an individual jogger. The second, uh, in verse 21, it says, um, in whom the whole building um, fitted together. Uh, this is the second of three Greek words uh, in this portion of text, that start with the same prefix, uh, and they mean uh, either with or together. Uh, fellow citizens is the one, fitted together is the other, and built together. Those three terms all start with the same Greek prefix. Back in verses 5 through 7, you don't have to turn there, but it's in the same chapter, we also had three Greek prefixes used three times to enforce that our unity in salvation was with Christ. So God is, through the Holy Spirit, making the point that it is a with. It is a with. You're saved individually, but then you're brought with the body of Christ. First into union with Jesus, but then into union with his disciples. And in that union, then he places the Holy Spirit in us individually and collectively. The Western or American notion that I don't need to be in church to be a Christian is diametrically opposed to Scripture doesn't mean that you're a Christian because you go to church. We just pray that we even have people that come to church that aren't saved. But it does say that the true believers will want to be part of a body gathering because the Holy Spirit would never tell them something different. He's told every other saint for 2,000 years. There's not a new doctrine for it. The same message is that it would be diametrically opposed. Israel was supposed to go forward as 12 tribes together and not say, hey, I think our tribe, we, we want to be this one uh, out in China. You 11, do whatever you want. It was supposed to be together. In Mark 16, verse 18, listen to what Jesus said. Again, these are Jesus' exact words. He said, 
Are you sure this is right? Well, listen to Jesus. And also I say to you, Peter, his, his, he gave him this word, Peter, Simon. Whenever he was Simon, that was, he was, uh, Peter was off the rails. Whenever he was doing right, he called him Peter, which means little rock. He said, you are Peter, little rock. On this rock, he now speaks, Jesus speaking of himself, on this rock, the cornerstone, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He said what? I'll build my what? Church. Do you know what that word means? You might have heard the word before. It's a Greek word called ecclesia. You ever heard that term? Ecclesia. You know what ecclesia means? It means a gathering of citizens called out from their homes into a public place and assembly. Hmm. Gathering them out of their homes into a public place and assembly. Later, in the same Greek, it meant in the early church, it added this meaning. An assembly of Christians gathered for worship and religious meeting. The same word is used 118 times in the New Testament, and it always means assembled together. God says, Ecclesia, I want on the, my church, as they gather, where two or three are gathered to what? Pray, witness, open the word, I will explode with the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. If they neglect it and forsake it, then it'll be detrimental to them personally, but also to the work of Christ. I guess we could say that technically someone could be married and willingly never come home to their spouse and just send a check for bills and maybe send an email uh, and maybe even get together, how about this, for Christmas and Easter. They would be married, but they'd have no marriage, right? There's no heart of the marriage there. And Paul is expressly saying that Jesus saved us to come together, to bond together, to serve together, because the mission of God is too big to be done by ourselves. It's too big to be done alone. It can't be done alone. It's like a tennis ball. You hit a tennis ball, it's moving in one direction quickly, but then it hits a wall, and then it's coming backwards. We can only go so far on our own momentum. We can only grow so far alone. I've learned this personally. Uh, God has shown me, and before I got saved, I didn't even, I, I didn't even come home to family meetings, family reunions. I don't need these people. I was, I've always been very self-reliant. God has said, you're way too self-reliant. He's even taught me in the last four years, the last two years, even this year, you need people in ways you don't know, and I'm going to make your clicker be an, an example of this in the message. <laughs> just to, just, if it doesn't remind anyone else, it'll remind you. It does remind me. Everyone needs close personal discipleship and mentoring. Um, think about this. You get saved, you're a baby in Christ. How many of you, when you were a baby, didn't change your own diapers? The spirits and the physical parallel each other. Just like a baby would not survive if someone wasn't personally involved in their life, Christians that say, well, now that I'm saved, I don't need anybody. I just can't, I don't need to work in the body of Christ. I don't need to serve. I don't need to be discipled. I don't need to be mentored. I don't need to be in fellowship. I don't need anything. So, well, tell that to a two-year-old. Oh, well, that doesn't work because that's physical. God is trying to say, if, if you said, don't believe me, read the scripture, you'll see that the parallels are all there. He's saying the same, I did that. That's why he said you can't even get saved unless you become like a little child. The Physical is to show us that the spiritual is a mirror. We need, just like kids can't raise themselves, Christians can't raise themselves. They need other believers in their life to do it. This is why Paul wrote these things to the Ephesians. Every Christian needs this. Every stone that has been cut from the earth is the former life, and then it's placed in and fitted into the uh, building of the household of God. And this is what it's saying here, that it's fitted together. Jesus fits each stone. You and I are one of the stones fitted into the temple. We are one of those stones fitted in. We're not codependent, but we are interdependent. That makes sense? We are interdependent of one another. And the starting point is believing that this is true and praying it in your life. Say, Lord, I believe this is true. I'm willing to be made willing. I'm going to pray this. Lord, I'm going to take my place within the ministry of being discipled or discipling other people. I'm going to take my place within the body of Christ. I'm going to serve in the body. I'm going to be part of that wall that you've placed me in. Fit it in. Did you know, and we're, we're almost closed here, but this is really cool stuff. I want to finish with this. It will really help you understand something, I believe. 
Did you know when Solomon built the first temple, because Paul references temple here, he says, you're being built into a holy temple. When Solomon built the first physical temple, at the entrance of the temple building, he placed two huge brass pillars. So when you'd walk in, the main, there was these two huge brass pillars that held up the porch. Massive structures. And at the top, um, I'll get to that in a second, uh, he named the pillars. He named the pillars, two names. The one on the right side was called Jacob, and it means he shall, establish, uh, he shall establish. It means firm and stable. The other pillar he named Boaz, and it meant in, in it is strength, or simply strength. Taken together, the two pillars mean this, stability and strength. Stability and strength. That was the first thing you would see when you're coming. Those two massive pillars. Then at the top of the pillars, there was a carving of ornate lilies. Lilies were carved at the top of it. And the two pillars were strong and stable, but the lilies were a picture of them being living. Living pillars. And the fragrance of lilies are amazing. You ever smelled a lily? They're an amazing fragrance. Jesus is called what? The lily of the valley. But here's the image Paul is referencing in the temple. Christian, you and I cannot be strong and stable. We cannot be the fragrance of Christ unless we're placed into the temple. That's the picture. Solomon got, he was the wisest man ever. He understood. He was foreshadowing the future body of Christ there. The strong, stable church, the strong, stable believer, is placed into the temple, and God carves lilies in us, makes us strong together, and then fits every piece in there. Amen? Amen. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you that you have done the work in many in this room of justification. You sealed us to the day of redemption. But Lord, we have also, the need for sanctification to be fitted together, that iron sharpens iron, to grow together, to mature together. We need each other more than we think we do. And Lord, the mission's too big for any one person. Certainly too big for me, certainly too big, and each individual here, their family, they need encouragement. They need each other. And Lord, that is by the grace of God, given through the Holy Spirit. But Lord, we have to embrace the family that you have placed within, placed us within, Lord. And I just pray, Lord, this morning that uh, through your word, you have spoken to each and every heart what, what is needed, Lord. Those that perhaps have never been brought into the family of God, that you would have clearly called them by name to carve them out of this world and place them in. Those that, Lord, uh, are a stone in the house, but it's time, Lord, to bear more weight. It's time to be fitted in a place that really supports the overall structure of the house. And Lord, those that are tired or weary would, would have other stones placed around them for added support. That you've placed us in this body to rightly represent you to a lost and dying world. And so we ask, Lord, that you would reveal to, by your spirit what each person needs. And I ask this in Jesus' name. I'm going to ask you to keep your heads bowed for just a moment because we're going to, we're going to take the Lord's Supper in just a, just a couple of minutes here. But this message is mostly, as well, last week, mostly to believers because God is telling through Paul that this is how I fitted the body together. But you might be visiting or, or maybe you've been coming and, and you've never responded to the invitation first to come into the household of God. As I mentioned in the beginning, this invitation is for everyone. Everyone is invited. Everyone's invited to the banquet table of forgiveness and the healing waters of Jesus. But not everybody comes. I wisely came. Smartest thing. I've done a lot of dumb things, but the smartest thing I ever did was I came to Jesus June 1995. This very month, 22 years ago, me and my wife on the same day stood up, our hearts pounding out of our chest. What are people going to think about us? 
God says, don't worry about them. I'm going to love you for all eternity. And if you're here today and say, I want to give my heart to Jesus. I want to be saved. I want to be forgiven. I want the guilt, the shame, the sins that I'm carrying right now all to be taken off my back and out of my heart. I want to be radically transformed. I want to be in the household of God. I want this peace you're talking about that you can't buy with $700 million. I'm going to ask you just stand right where you're at. Stand right where you're at. Don't worry about what other people, all they'll, all they'll do is rejoice with you. I pray and dream about it. I believe it's coming. We're going to see a lot of people saved here. I'm just claiming that by faith, by the way. But it starts with one or two. If you're here and you say, I, I don't know Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I want to be adopted by God today. To, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Is there anyone at all? Just stand right where you're at. And we'll pray with you. Anyone at all. If you want to stand and you're not standing, it's not God who's having you stay seated. It's Satan. It's not God. God would say, rise to your feet and receive. Rise and receive. Anyone at all. It's worth belaboring because your soul is worth it. One last call before I speak to everyone else who maybe that I am saved. So the rest in here, you, all of us have to say, Lord, give me an assessment. Where am I in the building? You've got to ask God honestly for assessment. God, am I fitted in or am I a stone that's sitting out in the pile, not even in the building? Are you fitted in? Are you in relationship? Are you in fellowship? Are you part of serving in this mission? Are you part of the family chores? Are you being refreshed and prayed over by other believers because you're, say, well, I work six days a week. I'm going to tell you I can come on Sunday. Well, you need to get on a text thread with other believers. So I don't know how to do that. Come talk to me. I'll, I'll guarantee we can fix that. You need each other. You need the body of Christ, but God says, I'm, I'm going to spur you into. And as we take of the Lord's Supper together, take this time to recommit. Say, Lord, I'm going to be coming into the temple, not just the physical building, that's, that's important, but into the strength and stability and the fragrance of Christ of gathering with the body. The, Jesus said, that's why I want you to take the Lord's Supper together, not just all by yourself, together. The worship team's going to be playing. I ask you just to pray, and if there's sin in your heart, confess it. Leave it with the Lord. Even as we're taking these communion elements. I don't normally do this, but I'm going to open up the altar. If you, anyone says, I, I want to come forward and be prayed over, you can come forward and we'll, we'll all take the communion together, but there may be some that say, I, I really need to be prayed over for whatever reason. Then you come. And just, you can stand right here. We'll pray over you individually. They're going to pass out the elements. Worship team will be singing. If you want to, to, to leave something here. There's nothing special about the altar, but there is something special about making commitment. So if you say, well, Lord, I want to make some commitment, you can come forward and stand here, and we'll pray with you, and we'll take these elements together.
Christ don't realize how great God's love really is for them. You know that? You may not in this room. I, I, I think the cross uh, is some kind of distant, uh, you, know, for, you know, for the first couple hundred years, no one could wear a cross because the, the, they couldn't use it for the arts because it was too horrific. Nobody said, I want a cross on my necklace. It did not, I mean, you'd be like wearing an electric chair or something. No one, no one wanted, it was too barbaric, but it demonstrated how much Jesus loved humanity. Um, I have, I don't, you know, for me, the Lord has been showing me in the last few months and even the last couple of years, um, I, I've been, I'll tell you right now, you can pray for me, I've been in more spiritual warfare than I've been in my entire lifetime. <laughs> You know, I felt like uh, I, I'm fighting off, you know, just things right and left. But here's the thing. Uh, I also have experienced more joy in God saying, this is a purification process. Do you know that, uh, you, ever, you ever heard of this guy, Job? Yeah. <laughs> you ever heard of him? Did you know that God said to Satan, he said, consider my servant Job. There's not one more righteous on planet Earth than him. And Satan says, let me tear him to pieces. So Satan did his thing and did all this kind of stuff. At the end of it, now Job was 
called the most righteous man on the earth at the time. God said, I, I love him. He's doing great things. At the end of Job, chapter 42, last chapter, after Job's been put through the ringer, this is what he says. I've heard of you by the hearing in my ear. Now my eyes see you. I thought Job knew God really well. Next verse. Therefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Many in the body of Christ think they're doing fantastic. And Jesus said, I bid you to come and take up your cross. Many in the body of Christ think, well, I, yeah, I, I, I appreciate the cross. And Jesus said, no, you don't. You do not appreciate the cross. You do not appreciate my salvation. You are saved, but you don't appreciate it. That's why Jesus wrote her personal letters to the seven churches of Asia, because most of them had just fallen asleep. And Job wasn't asleep. You understand, Job was not asleep, and God says, even you have a long, long, long way to go. And I tell you what, we as a church, we've come a long way, but we've got a long way to go. And I don't say that, you know, I love you guys dearly. I'm not saying that. for any, God's saying, come to the deeper waters, right? Come into the deeper waters. Stop playing the shallow end of the pool. Amen. Come to the deeper water. Come understand how much I love you. You know there's people in this place that need to be healed. But you've got to intercede for them, you know? You've got to pray for them. Jesus, uh, as he came and gave his life, he wanted us to remember uh, the elements that we're about to take of because he said, when you meditate on these things, it'll remind you of what I've done for you. And I've done great things for you. Do you believe he's done great things for you? Then he's worthy of our full surrender. It's our reasonable sacrifice, Romans chapter 12. I'm going to pray for these that came forward, though, before we take the elements together. Before I do, is there anyone else that wants to come forward and join them? I just want to pray for them. The wisest thing, it's a humbling thing to ever put ourselves before God. That's why very few people will do it. But I'll tell you one thing, it's worth it. When God breaks you and humbles you, you're going to see victories that you never saw possible. In this room, God wants to humble and break us. He loved Job. You, you really love Job, don't you? He said, but Job, you, I want you to really have a relationship with me. Deeper than... And when Job did that, guess what? Job could then disciple many other people. Don't you? you know, wouldn't you like to have seen his ministry after he'd been restored? So, if you're going through tough times, say, God, what are you trying to teach me? What are you trying to do in me? Let me go into a deeper walk with you. Let me finally take prayer seriously. Let me help other people, love other people. Let me pray for thee. Anyone else want to join them? You, you know, if you can come forward, just stand right where you're at. And I'll just pray specifically, say, I need prayer. I just, I really need God's help. All right. Yeah, just stand right where you're at. Others may say, you know, I'm standing with you, so I'm already standing. I'd, I'd stand if I was out there. So. I'm not pleading to emotions. I'm telling you right now, I'm not. God knows my heart. He wants to heal. He wants to do a great work in you. This is not emotions. This is, do you, do you need Jesus' help? If you don't need his help, yeah. well, we do. Whether we realize it or not, we do. It's like I needed the sound boost help today. I didn't realize I needed their help. But I did need their help. Thought I had it under control. All right, I'm going to pray. And you can stand even at the last second here, because God, he'll look at your heart. Lord, you see each and every person standing. You know what issues they're dealing with. You know what... Maybe guilt they're feeling. Maybe it's um, weariness. Maybe it's a physical ailment. Maybe they haven't felt like praying and they know they need to pray. Maybe they haven't been able to even work up a prayer. Maybe they have been depressed or gripped by fear or anxiety. Uh, or maybe it's unforgiveness. Maybe someone hasn't forgiven them and it's just tearing them apart. Whatever it is, Lord. Uh, Lord, 
like Job, even on our best days, Lord, we're nothing but filthy rags. And we thank you for the blood of Jesus, which not only, Lord, cleanses from sin, but heals us, mind, body, and spirit. Lord, you've not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And Lord, I just pray that each of these are standing, that in their hearts right now, they're crying out, God, forgive me. Give me faith where I don't have faith. Give me courage. Give me peace. And Lord, that you'd reward their standing. You'd reward their humility. You'd reward... You said that blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And I pray, Lord, they're not just thirsting for your touch, but they're thirsting for your righteousness. To be put as pillars in the temple of strength, stability, and the fragrance of Jesus Christ. Lord, they're not just desiring to be delivered, but desiring to be used, as Paul said, poured out like a drink offering. Lord, when this church is poured out like a drink offering, we will see hundreds come to Christ. But until then, Lord, we pray that your spirit would move upon your people and you would stir our hearts. Lord, I pray your richest blessing, healing, forgiveness, strength, peace, grace, faith on each of these that are standing. In your name I pray, amen.